So one of the delightful things about setting up your own agency is you get to film cows, especially if it's called the Bountiful Cow. Um, I spent weeks doing that on my gardening leave. It was a lot of fun. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about where we've come from as an agency and how news brands fit in, into our ecosystem as a new, new agency. I'm only going to talk about us and our creds for about five minutes. So those of you in the agency world, tell me if I'm boring you. Um, the truth is, having worked in various different organisations over 20 years or so, um, I wanted to come and create an agency that actually breath, dr drove a proper lungful of, breath, of fresh air into this industry. Um, and you spend weeks and weeks and weeks worrying about your proposition, what you're going to stand for. Uh, and we got to this position where we want to stand as the free range media agency. Obviously, loads of puns we can do around the world, world of Bountiful Cow. Um, but free range allows us to work with anyone in any way. Um, and uh, I strongly believe that the best, best opportunity of getting the best out of this industry is through collaboration and impartiality. Um, we're 10 months old. We're now billing £17 million. Uh, we've got nine clients uh, and we've got seven people on board. If I'd been told that I'd be in that position 10 months ago, I would have bitten that, that person's arm off. Um, and I think it's, um, it's testament to the fact that there is desire out there for a new model and a new way of working. And it's not that complicated. Um, we did one thing. We wanted to come into the market and put passion back into this industry and the work that we do. Um, the reality is, and I know you all work in some of these environments, um, is that in time and as an agency starts to understand different revenue streams and different ways of driving their own income, the passion and the interest in that is directly related to the client's work starts to get diluted. And our single-minded mi mission is to put that passion back into the way that we work and the work that we do for our clients. And to us, success is creating work that actually doesn't define creative and media. It's that sort of intersection in between the two where you drive some level of cultural resonance and people don't really understand whether it's a creative or media idea. And we set the agency out with one core goal to drive work that works and to get paid directly and only for doing work that works for those clients. But when you're setting up an agency, it's really weird. Like If you were to ask me in February, March last year, when I was given the brief what this agency would have been, I would have sat back and gone, it's all about data and content and a single platform buy, and it's all about the automation of this, this industry, cutting out headcount and actually driving costs as low as they possibly can be. We set out to create a modern agency with traditional values. And when I look back at where we've got to in 10 months, I sat down when I was given the brief for this presentation and went, oh my God, have we actually created a modern agency? Because the reality is over 25% of our billings on our client base goes through a news brand of one sort or another. And surely when you're setting up an agency, you should be thinking about how much we should invest into Google and Facebook how much we should invest into technology over people, um, how many data scientists we should employ, because this world is moving into this really exciting space that's driven and powered by data. But we haven't. We haven't done that. And I've asked myself why a number of times. And actually, in this presentation, I think I'm going to justify why we haven't done that. I'm not saying it's never going to happen, but in this market, at this present moment, it's given us the opportunity to have to start to think and operate in the way that we have. Bubble thinking, sitting in a bubble in an agency. I mean, that, that video made me laugh a lot because I don't know whether you noticed in the back there was a um, poster with a, uh, an advert for a, for a four-pint jug of Aspals for £12. In London, <laughs> it would have been closer to £30. So, you know, we sit in a bubble as media planners and buyers, but in London we sit in a bubble in a bubble. Um, and it's massively important that we don't self-destruct by operating and thinking in that way. And so we've worked really, really hard to make sure that we're challenging ourselves at every single step along that way and not allowing that bubble to actually influence our thinking. Secondly, there's this massive, massive wave of the magpie generation. I don't know whether how many of you follow Mark Ritson uh, from marketing, who spends most of his time down in Australia, but he's well worth following because he's quite amusing and very vocal about some of this stuff. Uh, and this quote made me, a lot, made me laugh because he said... Uh, I cannot name the person for obvious reasons. He was well known in one of the country's most, uh, in one of the country's foremost media uh, strategists. 
who recently said to me, if I'm given a brief and respond with a print solution as being, the impactful, and co being impactful and cost effective, I'll be shown the door. And that's not an agency problem, that's also a client challenge. The clients are pushing and pushing for the next generation of media, they're doing the new thing. And I think it's quite sad that we're at risk of throwing away all the learning that we've had over decades and decades of doing fantastic work with which some people deem as traditional media. Um, and if any of you follow us on Twitter, our job really is to challenge the magpies. Uh, and we do that in two ways. One, we're here to question the validity and the value of their point of view about the new generation of data and content and how it's gonna drive everything forward. Because we all know the issues around measurabilities and the value of an impact or a video view on TV, on online versus TV. Uh, and in fact, my brother's been massively vocal about you know, the power of humans in that space. And then, most importantly, you have to question the motives behind those people as to why they are pushing all these new platforms and new ways of working. Um, is it in the interest of the client or is it in the interest of the agency? And our role is there to challenge it. Um, and I don't know how many of you see this on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, in my previous world, I was continually told the platform is a plan, so when you're asked to present a media plan in the programmatic space to a client, they'll go, there you go, it's just a platform. So, what do you mean it's a platform? Well, because you know, it's a data-driven buy, and we're buying the right audience in the right time and the right place. But the clients need to know where we are, and we need to know what's happening. Um, and it became incredibly hard to get clients to understand the value of that way of thinking if you're not starting to consider the world of context. The other challenge is, I, my, my actual belief is that if we believe the world of data and and automated trading to the extent to which it could be delivered, we'll end up being served mirrors of ourselves. Day in, day out, you'll see the same ads telling you to do the same thing based on your data footprint. We believe that wastage is good and discovery is great and we believe in the spirit of serendipity to help people discover and experience new brands and concepts. Um, and the final point on this, I had breakfast with um, uh, Nick Hewitt from Guardian a couple of weeks ago talking about this and, and this world. And he mentioned to me one agency that has absolutely stopped trading with them on their programmatic desk entirely um, for no reason other than cost. Uh, and you sit there and you go, how can something like The Guardian, with its power of readership, the power of the brand, be ignored by an agency that's billing hundreds of millions of pounds? Uh, how could that possibly be in the interest of, of, the age, of the clients for which it's working? And that's our challenge, and that's why we're here to do things differently. The other thing Denise uh, asked me to think about was the short and the long term. Um, the nature of starting an agency from scratch is you start to work with these fascinating businesses where you are front and centre in their business. Um, and again, if I was to ask myself what I was thinking about what the agency would be 12 months ago, um, it would have been, as I say, digital and data first. The reality is that most of the type of clients that we work with, which are the second generation startup clients coming to spend in media for the first time, they've built their digital machines. They know more about their business than any agency will know about the performance of those channels. Of course, they need some consultancy help in that space. Um, but the reality is the short term, in our experience, and I am only talking about seven or eight clients, is being managed by those, those clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So that then throws up a very different challenge for the role of the agency. Um, and that's very much about helping that client grow into what we would deem the offline or traditional space. Helping them build a brand. Helping them spend that first million, million and a half pounds in, in media that they recognize, they understand, but also is actually appealing to humans and, and doing a job for the client. Um, and it's why we've been employed by some clients like Skybet, where we're actually helping them plan across a paid owned earned matrix, it's not about media planning and buying, it's about taking that holistic view and understanding the long-term benefit for clients. The other thing that I found really interesting, and it, the penny dropped for me probably about six months in, is our clients own their businesses. It is their business. They care about every single thing that they do. Um, this, is, this lady here is Henrietta Morrison, who uh, set up Lily's Kitchen eight years ago. Uh, she set this business up because her dog had itchy skin uh, and she started cooking dog food, well, her own food for the dog and then started to realise that actually her dog started to get healthier, started to build a brand and a product and a business around it and now they're billing over te well, tens of millions of sales around that very story. 
And of those of you who ever bought Lily's Kitchen, it's phenomenally expensive compared to a winner lot. Um, but it's got an authenticity and a truth at the heart of that business that it's now extending into their offline uh, marketing space. Um, and what we found is actually, if you look across our sort of core client base, most of the clients that we've got have that authenticity and reality of the brand at the, at the core of their business, all the way through to Skybet, who you know, are you know, venture capitalists owned, but they are accountable to themselves on how they deliver and what they do. Um, so when you get into this space and working with those entrepreneurs and those people who care about their brand, this isn't rocket science, but context is absolutely king. Um, and Henrietta is, a, is, a, is hilarious because she cares so much. I think I've spent days, if not weeks, with her in rooms, poring over schedules, asking about the placements of her precious ad campaign. Um, and I don't know how, much of you, how many of you have actually seen this campaign in the traditional pr press environment, um, but we're really proud because we've got 100% of the executions in 100% of the right placements to match the creative with the media, um, and we're reaching 100% humans. Um, and the question then becomes, well, how's that helping the business? Is it, is it really helping them drive growth? Well, Lily's Kitchen, as of last week, are already on target to hit their, their, goal, their sales goal for the end of the year, and are now looking at stretch targets beyond that, which are probably another five, five or six million pound sales. I'm not saying that's driven by, purely by the news brand uh, integration, but it's driven by a, a level of honesty and authenticity in how, how you deliver into the news brand space. At the other extreme, uh, you get to meet some mad entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, we met a guy called uh, David Spencer Percival, a, one of the weirdest new business leads that ever came in. The guy virtually walked in off the street. Um, David Spencer Percival, if you look him up, he's the CEO of Spencer Ogden, one of the biggest recruitment companies in the UK. Him and his wife, uh, about 18 months ago, were on holiday in a village called Akiroli, uh, where they started to sort of look around the population and realised that a load of the population looked incredibly healthy. Uh, big chunks of them were living over 100 years. There were no signs of Alzheimer's, heart disease, disease or any other sort of major illnesses. And they started to look into this and realised that actually this population were eating and chewing rosemary. Uh, and David, being the entrepreneur that he is, took that idea, brought it back to the UK, and is now squeezing rosemary essence into, into fizzy water and flogging it for £4.50 on King's Road. And, and you have to, and it's the most fascinating thing, because we got into news brands, because when we started working with him, we'd, we would do a nice, big, sexy media presentation, tell him what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. He totally ignored that. He would sit in his living room, take a picture of a 25 by 4 in the Sunday Times and say, Henry, can you buy me one of these? Um, and that's the power of this type of medium. The, the other thing that's really interesting about when you work with these, these businesses, you know, the, there is scientific proof behind Rosemary Water and how it works and how it actually helps with your mental uh, ability. Um, and in its very simplest, about two months ago, there was a couple of press articles around the power of Rosemary for exam students and helping them revise. We simply took those press clippings and re-delivered them as press executions the following day to supply better substantiation why, as to why Rosemary Water matters. Um, and the other half of this campaign is about how using the style brands and the environment and the context has opened doors for this business uh, to Ferndale Hotels, to Selfridges, um, to uh, the Olive Tree and Mr. and Mrs. Smith and so on. There's a massive credibility in news brands that we tend to forget uh, on a day-to-day. -day. So then I asked myself, oh, Henry, you're just being an idiot. You're just looking at the six clients that you work with. It's a little bubble in a little bubble in a little bubble. Um, but I genuinely believe there's a new generation of business coming through in this uh, country. Uh, and there's this idea of business as a force for good. Um, 1.8 trillion of the UK's economy is driven by SMEs. That's 47% of over, overall private sector turnover. Um, and when you start to look around the business and you start to look at um, things like B Corp, I don't know how much you guys have actually looked into, the, into this, but this is the new generation of uh, brands that have that aut authenticity and reality at the heart of what they do. Um, and this isn't a dig directly at my old agency. Well, it might be, but this isn't about being a meaningful brand. It's about being meaningful people. It's about being a meaningful business. It's about being a meaningful history, and it's about meaningful, proper, and fair growth. And you look back at some of the videos that Denise has showed where actually 
those guys were talking about how fascinating it was that they had sort of independent new businesses popping up on their high street as opposed to the big corporate brands. We firmly believe that this is where the growth is. And these guys are the ones that really care about talking to humans, you know, and that they will do what they can to build that business, their business in the right way. So for them, it's personal, it's human, it's real, which again throws back into the news brand space. So 10 months in, I've just talked about that, and you can see, oh, that's just, it's traditional. It's traditional, it's the way that media works in the news brands. Come on, Henry, tell us something that's, you know, talk about embracing the future and the real potential around news brands. Um, and I'm really pleased to share with you some early work that we started to do um, around the Movember Foundation in partnership with News UK and Sky. Uh, Movember, I don't know how many of you have grown a mo in, in November. You probably did it 10 years ago and haven't done it since. Last year, well, they last year. There we go. How many of you actually know what Movember stands for? What three charities does it support? Two or three. So Movember supports prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and men's mental health. They're the biggest donators to prostate cancer and uh, testicular cancer within, within the UK. Uh, they're a charity that's been around for 15 years, but no one really knows what they do. Everyone thinks it's a bit quirky, and it's lost its way in, its, in the overall sort of charity landscape. Um, six months ago, we briefed News UK and Sky to come to us with a, come back to us with a response to a brief that really was about how do we drive and use your context and your editorial and your owned power to actually seed the message and get people to understand uh, what Movember does and how important it is to, this, to the UK population and get people to get involved and start uh, growing a mo and become a mo bro. Um, and it took six months to sort of craft of working with News UK to get to where we've got to now. Um, and massive testament to their team strategically, internally for this. They came to us with a three sort of phase campaign. So Movember is all around be the difference. You know, if you grow a mo, you're being the difference, you're making an effort. And they, they came back to us and said, actually, well, we're going to do a three phase campaign. One around um, talk the difference. Uh, next one around be the difference, which is about getting people to actually engage and then see the difference, which is about celebrating those people that are growing mo's. Um, and the really interesting thing is they started it from a content position and an editorial position, not from a 25 by 4 next door to Dear Deirdre or a call to action, you know, in their sort of digital space. Uh, and they delivered this video in their pitch, which for us just was the penny dropping moment. Yeah, he got dressed and then he shook her hand. Oh. And <laughs> How many times a week do you polish the rocket? You're not even allowed to ask that. <laughs> yeah, well, I just have, mate. When was the last time you cried? I actually watched Interstellar for the second time. And my missus had fallen asleep, so I thought, right, I can actually cry to this now. Does talking about your feelings make you feel uncomfortable? I'm actually a very emotional guy, okay. um, but I don't like boys to know that. <laughs> I started counselling this week. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, gen genuinely. Something's brave even go and do it. I think most people just spit it off. If your knee fucking hurts, you go to the doctor and you and you say my knee hurts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it's your edge, you don't. No one ever fucking goes and yeah. says like I feel like, horrible all the time. The whole point is that it's not something that happens to everyone. that's in the shit. It's, it happens to everyone. Yeah. You know, it's one of nice little fucking mysteries. I don't know. I do think. Thanks, mate. It's alright, mate. Sorry, I told you that. No, mate, it's good. It's good. I would tell everyone if I was going to the doctors. I think you should go to the doctor for being a bit. And they've taken that idea, and over the next, well, from middle of October through to the first week of November, there will be about 30 different strands of content that bring that idea to life. Um, which will live and breathe in the news brand space, across their wireless space, and into uh, Sky itself as well. And some of the videos that they're currently creating with their own editorial support are pretty hard hitting. So uh, they've got a whole strand around the fear of missing out, um, which is this context of uh, people talking about uh, the fear of dying too young and not seeing their child get married or um, have children or walk for the first time, all that type of hard hitting content. Um, so look out for that, and there's no way that could have come to life without you know, a news brand's angle. Um, 
And then I guess the other side of it is we hit the sweet spot with these guys because when you talk to Sky and News at the moment, they're desperate to seem to be working together given the merger and everything else that's going on. Um, and I just wanted to give you a taste of what the Sky side of things are doing, which again would have only been opened up by the news brand conversation that we had with the, um, the studio guys at uh, News UK. <laughs> Sporting a, defining moment, Scott Quinnell. 94, Cardiff Arms Park, my first try for Wales. 1998 World Cup, that walk from the halfway line to the penalty spot. Max? <laughs> well, how long have you got? Not very long. Sit back. Al, what about you? I can't compete with any of you sporting legends, so my great defining moment is to come, and it's having a motor show in November. The reason that we're going to do it, every 45 minutes a man loses his life to prostate cancer, and three in four suicides are male. This could be the most important thing we do this year. It's time to stop talking and start growing. So back to <laughs> my sporting achievements. <laughs> no, Max. Not Seriously, back. no, not serious back. this not time. Back. So you get the sense of what we're doing with Sky. Uh, and uh, Paul Merson and Alex Hay, who head up the rugby and uh, football side of things, will both be growing Mo's in November. Um, and as I said before, this all builds out into a content-led ambassadors, owned and earned first with a bit of paid in it uh, partnership. Uh, the reality, and the really interesting thing is, I think we've probably got a five-fold ROI even before we do anything in terms of the money that we've spent on the partnership, partnership versus the value that's coming back and all the other things that are being being engaged in this. Um, and also, just a little bit of a sort of a PR thing, um, we're also launching the campaign M List this year. So we're mimicking the A List and turning it into the M List and celebrating anyone within the industry who is growing a mo. So if you want to be part of that, please let us know because we're having a little bit of fun with that. So that's me. Uh, I, so when I look back in the first 10 months, and I, and I know we're going to have bumpier uh, times in the road. Um, but it's been a fascinating 10 months. And when I look back at the presenta this presentation and look at our, our, our portfolio in terms of how we spent our media, I don't think I would change a thing. Uh, and news brands have been critical to that. Because in today's modern media world, we have to burst the bubble. We have to question and challenge the magpies. We have to release the power of the long term, help our economy thrive thanks to the smaller businesses and embrace the concept of business for good. So I think we're doing that, and we might just be on the edge of doing something that really actually merges media and creative in the whole Movember thing, thanks to news brands. Thank you.